Well, this morning, you know, we've been uh, doing um, kind of seminary level classes, Bible school kind of classes. Uh, one of the guys, one of the elders in our church said to me the other day, he said, well, you know, I never really have taken any Bible school classes. And I thought, well, it seems like the Lord is leading me to teach that level on um, on Sunday mornings, and so just keep listening here, <laughs> and uh, and and do some study afterwards, and you'll eventually get a Bible school level education. I think. Um, you know, actually, I think the Lord wants you, who are listening, to move to the next level in your own Bible study. Okay, I think he wants you to be motivated to uh, dig into the Bible and, uh, um, you know, like you've never done before. And, um, uh, and quit talking, quit, <laughs> quit going to see what somebody else has to say about the Bible, right? Uh, I, I want you to see some things that you've never seen before. I want you to get clarity that you've never had before. You can only get that when you seek the Lord on your own. And that means you're going to have to be willing to spend some time in the Word. You're going to have to be willing to spend some time um, with God, seeking Him and learning to listen to His voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit as He teaches you. Turn to John 14, 26, the Gospel of John chapter 14, and we're going to look at verse 26. John 14, 26, Jesus is talking and he says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance all things that I have said. This is Jesus' promise to us. Go to 1 John, 1 John 2, 1 John 2, 27. The promise is that the Holy Spirit will speak to us, and we need to learn to listen to that. 1 John 2, 27 says, As for you, the anointing which you received from him lives in you. And he, the him, of course, is Jesus. And you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has been taught to you, you live in Him. The Holy Spirit will teach us everything we need to know. But I want you to go to Hebrews 5, because this is what happens sometimes when we Christians become a little complacent in our study. <clears throat> Hebrews 5, verse 12. 5 and 12 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You have need again for somebody to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk, not solid food. You ought to be teachers yourselves, he's saying, rather than needing a teacher. So take this challenge to stand up on your own and to learn of God. And don't wait for me or some other teacher to spoon feed you, okay? You should be listening to the Holy Spirit and hearing things that I've never thought about before. Uh, and then you should be teaching me and others those truths that you're hearing. You know, Ian and Gloria, they do that with me all the time. They're seeing new stuff. They show it to me. Uh, that's how it's supposed to be. So to entice you to study the Bible for yourself, I want to present today a concept to you that at first uh, you might feel uncomfortable with. And first of all, uh, before I do this, I want to make sure that, uh, that you understand there is a comfortable part of what I'm going to say, and that is that the Bible is the infallible Word of God, right? Can we all agree to that? The Bible has been the, written by people who were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what they wrote. Agree? Okay. Now, for the part that you're this is going to give you some heartburn, did you know that the translation of the Bible that you've been reading may not accurately reflect what the original writer was inspired to write. There are places where the original author wrote one thing 
And then when they translated it into English, the translator used the wrong English word. And I just want you to let that soak in for a minute. <laughs> like, well, what? <laughs> how can I trust it? Father Dan, how do I know that when I'm reading the Bible that, you know, that I'm getting what the original author meant to say to me? Well, this brings us back to how I started this lesson with a challenge to dig in, dig deep, and study the Bible for yourself. Do that under the anointing and the illumination of the Holy Spirit. You may need some tools to show you what the original words mean. You know, so you can see for yourself whether what was translated was translated correctly. And no, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to do this. Um, God didn't give us his word in a way that would require some human mediators to come in to help us understand it, okay? That's why I read those first three scriptures a minute ago to show you that the Lord expects you to be able to hear accurately from the Holy Spirit and to learn directly from the Holy Spirit for yourself. Now, having said that, don't shy away from reading commentaries and, you know, what Bible scholars might have to say. Uh, shoot, a lot of times they have good stuff to say, and you'll probably learn something from them too. But don't rely on them. Uh, rely on what's written in the Bible and what you hear from the Holy Spirit. So today, we're going to look at some of these mistranslations. And I want you to please write down each one of the scriptures, each one of the words or phrases that we're talking about, and study them out for yourself. This is your homework assignment in seminary, okay? You might see some of these things differently than I do as you study it out. And you know what? That's okay. Just so you're digging it out for yourself. That's how I feel about this. Okay, first mistranslation. Turn to Philippians 4. A lot of these mistranslations, the problem with them is that it changes how we view our Christianity and our walk with the Lord, and it paints an incorrect picture of walking in the Spirit and, and who we are in Christ and things like that. And this is the, the first one is a great example of that. Philippians 4, verse 13. Philippians 4 and verse 13, my Bible reads this. It says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. But you know what? If I look at the original Greek and I look at that word through, I discover it's the Greek word in, E-N. And you know what that means? It means in, like in a fixed position. The word, the Greek word for through is D-I-N, and it means like a channel. And so if this really is through, then you would have to say, okay, I'm going to do all things through Jesus. What does that mean? Is Jesus somehow channeling me, and, and I go into Jesus, and I control his hands and his feet, and that's where I'm strong and can do all things? Is, it, is that what that, that, that just doesn't make sense, does it? But to say that I can do all things if I am firmly fixed in Jesus, that has almost the opposite meaning. That means that Jesus is actually working through me. Okay? I'm not doing the impossible things. Jesus is doing those, but he's doing it through me because I'm living in him. He's living in me. Well, of course Jesus can do impossible things if he's living in me, right? I mean, he's Jesus. So if he's living in me, why can't I do those things? I can do all things in Jesus who lives in me. Never again quote this scripture as written, okay? But instead say, I can do all things in Jesus who strengthens me. Okay, the next one is another example of kind of obfuscating who we are in Christ and really kind of dumbing us down a little bit as Christians. Turn to Romans 1. So I want to ask you a question. What does the word saint mean? Have you ever looked that up? Um, it's in the New Testament all the time, right? You know what it means? 
Well, let's see. Romans 1, 7 uses the word saint. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, my translation says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, first thing that I noticed, unfortunately, I've got a translation. It's called the New American Standard Bible. And it shows where the translators added a word that wasn't in the original. And in this case, they added the word as between called and saints. And so my translation reads uh, that uh, he's writing to the beloved of God in Rome called saints. Not called as saints, called to be saints is how we might interpret that word as. What he's saying is, I'm writing to those who are called saints. Oh, okay. Well, what does saint mean then? Okay. If you look at the Greek word there, it's the Greek word hagios. And that simply means holy. Matter of fact, if you go up to verse 2, It says in verse 2, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. It's exactly the same word as is translated saints down there in verse 7. Go to Romans 5. Romans 5 and verse 5. Romans 5, 5 reads, And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Did you know that the word holy there comes from the Greek word hagios? Everywhere else in the New Testament, 222 times, the word hagios is used. And it's translated holy everywhere except where it describes Christians. And when it describes Christians, instead of saying holy ones or holy people, It uses this word saints, and it's like it's trying to obfuscate the fact that we're holy. Using a word like saints covers up the true meaning of what the author was writing. Did you know that if you look up saint in your dictionary, it'll say a person of exceptional holiness. If you come from a Roman Catholic background, that's somebody who's done at least three verifiable miracles, and they were voted on by the Council of Cardinals, and all kinds of rigmarole now they're up above everybody else, and they're special people. You know, it's like the, the, the way they put use this word saint is meant to divide the church instead of bring the church together. The correct translation, let's go back to Romans 1 and 7. The correct translation there uh, would be Paul is, is writing to those who are beloved in Rome called holy ones. Wow! What a difference that makes. I am called holy by God. I'm not just some Another human being walking on the earth. I'm holy before God. All Christians are holy to God. (laughs) From now on, when you see the word saints in the Bible, just in your mind, retranslate that as holy ones. Think about that a minute. Think about what a difference that makes in how we perceive ourselves. I get up in the morning. I've been forgiven by God. That means I'm innocent. I get up in the morning. I'm a Christian serving God. That means I'm holy. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Uh, (laughs) I'm made in the image of Him. I mean, just all of these things that are so positive about who we are. And to think, I am holy before God. That's going to change how I act. Okay, now i got a, a strange question for you. Did Jesus ever get sick? Now, I'm not going to answer that question today. I'm going to leave it hanging for you, but I'm going to show you why it becomes a question in my mind. Turn to Isaiah 53, or Isaiah, as some might say. I think Isaiah is probably a better pronunciation, right? Isaiah 53 and verse 3. Now, a lot of us could quote uh, uh, verse 3, verse 4 here from memory, but I'm going to read it. From my translation, it says he was despised and forsaken of men. Who's he talking about here? Talking about Jesus, right? It's a prophecy about Messiah. 
a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So using the word griefs and sorrows there is like, well, he's going to take away all my sadness. That's kind of the, the English translation that you would get from that, right? But if you look at the Hebrew words behind that, in both verses, the Hebrew word for sorrow or sorrows means pain, sadness, and grief. Okay, well, that might make sense for sorrow. Uh, grief, but they're already using the word grief somewhere else. What does that word mean in Hebrew when they use grief? Well, you know what? <clears throat> it doesn't mean grief. It means sickness and disease. And I'm telling you, you have to wonder, why did they translate it as grief instead of sickness and disease when that's clearly what it means? That's how it's translated everywhere else in the Old Testament. How do they get this that wrong? Uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, I just don't understand. I can't even imagine why they would do that. But it paints such a different picture of who Jesus was. Here again, the mistranslation gives us a wrong worldview. Uh, it's, let's concentrate on the sickness part of this mistranslation for a minute, okay? It says that Jesus was acquainted with sickness and disease. Now, it doesn't say that. In English, but it says that in Hebrew. He was acquainted with sickness and disease, and he bore our sickness and disease. So now that we know this, that this is talking about sickness, not grief, what might we think? Well, does that mean that Jesus ever got sick? Maybe as a little boy, did he get sick? Why not? I mean, <laughs> Jesus was sinless. The Bible doesn't say he never got sick. Maybe he did. Uh, maybe Jesus got sick and that helped him have compassion for sick people. I mean, everywhere you look in the New Testament, he's, he's got great compassion for those that are sick. I had a friend, he's a, if you look at him, he's a real rough, burly guy. He's a motorcycle rider and looks like it. And, but he's this great, sweet Christian guy. And uh, he's in Alabama. I was in his church ministering one time. And actually, at the time, I had shingles on my face. It was very painful. And he and another guy prayed for me. And, uh, and the Lord healed me instantly of the shingles. And he was telling me, he said, you know, um, I have real compassion for you and what you're going through with these shingles. That's why I wanted to pray for you. He said, up until a few months ago, I'd never been sick in my life. And I came down and he, he, he said what he had come down with. And it was very painful. It was very distressing for him. And it, the doctors didn't know what to do or how to fix it. God eventually healed him. But he said, you know, having been sick like that gave me a real compassion for sick people. I wonder if the Lord, if the Father, if Daddy, Father, our Heavenly Daddy, led his son Jesus through some sickness so he would have compassion. It says that he experienced everything that we did, right? I think one of the other things that we can take away from understanding the correct translation here is that when Jesus went to the cross, he took away our sickness. I know that sometimes we pray and the person doesn't get well. I don't understand why that is. But this I do know. Jesus carried away all sickness on the cross so that we never have to bear, un bear up under sickness ourselves. Turn to 1 Peter 2. I want to show you the mechanism that was used for Jesus to carry our sickness. 1 Peter 2, 24. And he himself bore our sins. This is 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by four. By his wounds we were healed. In other words, that's why when I lift the cup 
at Eucharist, I say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin and the sickness of the world. It was those stripes that he received on his back that put onto him all of our sickness. And it was those stripes that he carried to the cross. And it was through that that he carried and bore our sickness so we don't have to. So now you know how to translate Isaiah 53, 3 and 4. Jesus bore our sickness. Okay, here's one. Did you know that God has a name? We, uh, <laughs> we call him God, right? Well, sometimes we call him Heavenly Father, right? But he has a name. And his name is called the Tetragrammaton. <laughs> That's a big Greek word. It just means four letters, okay? And it's the four Hebrew letters that are used for the name of God. And they're consonants, Y-H-W-H. -H. Uh, the Hebrew alphabet doesn't have any vowels in it. So when it's written down, uh, you leave the vowels out. When you pronounce it, you have to put the vowels in. God's name is the Tetragrammaton. Now you know a big seminary term, right? Uh, turn to Nehemiah 8. And I want to show you how this is used. Nehemiah where is Nehemiah? There he is. Nehemiah 8. Nehemiah 8 and verse 6. So they're rebuilding the temple after captivity, right? Nehemiah 8 and 6 reads, Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while if lifting up their hands. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Okay, now when you read that in English, you go, what does that have to do with the Tetragrammaton, with the name of God? Well, as it turns out, both places there, the, what's been translated in English as Lord or the Lord is actually this Tetragrammaton. It's the, the Hebrew name for God. Did you know that the name of God is used in Hebrew 5,700 and 89 times in the Old Testament. And yet, not once is it ever translated as Jehovah or Yahweh or the Tetragrammaton YHWH. Not once. Why didn't the translators use the name of God? I mean, that hides that from us, right? Why do that? God has a name. You know what? You know why they did that? It started with a Jewish superstition. Let me show you. In Leviticus, in Leviticus 24, Leviticus 24, 16. And you can find other verses that say similar things. Leviticus 24, 16. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord, and there the Lord is Yahweh, or the Tetragrammaton, shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him, the alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name. The name of God. God has a name. Shall he be put to death? And so the Jews got to thinking, oh man, if we say the name of God, they got kind of superstitious. If we say Yahweh or Jehovah, however they would have pronounced it, uh, maybe we'll be blaspheming him. Maybe we'll be worthy to be stoned. So so they just, from at some point, they just declared the name of God is unpronounceable and, uh, and unsayable. And so it's going to be like the one whose name you can't say. And, and so it's illegal to say the name of God in their, <laughs> in their uh, religion. In about uh, 250 B.C., the Hebrew Bible, here, this is some more seminary stuff. This is like church history stuff that you need to know about. In about 250 B.C., the, the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek because so many Jews uh, had, were living in Greek areas and learned Greek to speak Greek. And that translation is known as the Septuagint. Septuagint is a word that mean, in Greek that means 70. And it comes from the fact that there were 70 Jewish scholars that did this translation from Hebrew to Greek. Well... When the 70 came to the Tetragrammaton, the name of God, they substituted the Greek word 
for Lord because they didn't want to say it. They were still superstitious about Leviticus 24, 16, right? And, and so then in the 1600s, when the King James translators started doing translations, um, they said, well, we'll just stick with uh, what the Septuagint uses, and we'll just say the Lord. And as a matter of fact, almost every English translation of the Bible does that. It sticks with that tradition from thousands of years ago. Modern translations have the Hebrew texts available. It's not like they don't know what word is there. But in, in case they, they purposely mistranslate the, Hewish, the, the Jewish word Yahweh to Lord, um, you know, why are they worried about that? Uh, why would our modern translators feel obligated to perpetuate a Jewish myth, a Jewish superstition? I can't give you a guess why, but I'm gonna I'm not gonna be robbed of the name of God, okay? Turn to Genesis 2. Genesis 2, verse 4. Genesis 2, 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth. Well, read this along with me if you can, so you can see the difference. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh, God, made earth and heaven. His name, and then we want to make sure you know that that's God. Okay, Exodus 3, Exodus 3 and verse 2, Exodus 3, 2, The angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. Psalm 1, 2. This is all over the book of Psalms. Psalms 1, 2. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh and his law. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Psalms 1, 6. Yahweh knows the way of righteousness, but the way of the wicked will perish. Everywhere you see the Lord in the New Testament, look it up. And in a lot of cases, you're going to find it's the Hebrew name for God. You're going to be surprised how we've been robbed of God's name. God's name, uh, maybe you pronounce it Yahweh, maybe you pronounce it Jehovah. We don't know how it was originally pronounced because the Jews haven't kept up with that. Okay, okay so God's got a name. <clears throat> Did you know that we don't have a heavenly father? Bah, what? <laughs> okay, this is just kind of a nit. Um, we have a heavenly daddy. Okay? Um, look to Mark 14. The Gospel of Mark. Gospel is another word that's mistran that shouldn't have ever been made up. They should have just left it as good news. Anyway, Mark 14, 36. In Mark 14, 36, Jesus is praying. He says, Abba. And then they translate that into Greek, pater, which means father. All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. The word that Jesus uses, Abba, is the Hebrew word for daddy, not the word for father. The word for father is Ab. I've had experience with this with uh, with, with Jewish people. Uh, a Jewish friend of mine, his dad was leaving. He said, bye-bye, Abba. And, and um, I thought, oh, you called him father. And he said, no, I called him daddy. I mean, he was adamant about it. Abba is daddy. It's a per very personal, very informal, friendly, whatever you want to call it term. Um, it's not father, son, stay away from me, don't get too close, and you call me father, not daddy. It's not that at all. It's a loving daddy that wants to reach his arms around us and love us. You know, when Pastor Jane prays for me, she addresses God as Yahweh and da or Jehovah, she uses that term, and daddy. She knows that God has a name, Jehovah or Yahweh, and she knows that Jehovah is not her heavenly, informal, faraway father, but her, in, her personal daddy, her heavenly daddy. Let's close with this. Romans 8. 
Romans 8 and 15. You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. He could have used the Hebrew word Av, but he didn't. He used the personal form. Galatians 4 and 6. He's saying the same thing here to the Galatians. Galatians 4 and 6. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Well, anyway, I'm going to stop there. You kind of get the gist of what we're doing. Let's see if uh, the Lord will let us do this next time uh, or if he wants me to do um, something else. Did you know that uh, Christ isn't Jesus' last name? Did you know that devil is not, I mean, that Satan is not the name of the devil? And Lucifer isn't his name either. And we can find those all from mistranslations. And maybe we'll do that next time. So anyway, God bless you. And, uh, and get your Bibles out. Study through this stuff and find out what the word really means. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart.